The African-American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, art, and religion. We will explore how African-Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Deirdre Harris Kelly, the co-director of the Romare Bearden Foundation. <laughs> Welcome, Deirdre. Thank you. Glad to have Very you with glad us. to be here. Um, I knew Romare Bearden. I was on the board of the Sinke Gallery, which he and Norman Lewis and Benny Andrews founded many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so pleased that this foundation is carrying out the traditions and the heritage of Romare Bearden. Yes. So tell me, how did the foundation get started? Well, the foundation was actually conceived in um, Bearden's will. It was something that he had hoped would happen. He didn't exactly frame it up to tell us exactly what we were supposed to do, but he did want the legacy to continue. Um, his legacy was about building institutions, um, you know, like the Sin K Gallery, which was a nonprofit gallery that supported, um, you know, artists of color and also um, curators. I mean, he, he had hoped that this would be a place where people could come together, um, and artists have used that gallery over and over the years. Um, unfortunately, it did um, go under a couple of years ago, and the foundation took it on as a program. Uh, so we call it the Sinke program, artist program, and we try to be in the spirit of Sinke. We don't have a gallery where we display the artist's work, but we do try to create spaces for artists to get together, and we also create um, panels that help to, um, you know, help artists in their careers, you know. Now, Romeo Bearden's story is really an illustrious story because he became famous later in life. That's right. Mm -hmm. When uh, he was doing his artwork, he was doing it in the evenings on Saturdays and Sundays because he had a regular uh, job working in the welfare department. That's right. And then later on, he became recognized mm -hmm. because of the creativity of his work. Mm -hmm. As things moved along, the black art community began to expand. Mm -hmm. The Harlem Renaissance was a time when the black artists were really popular, but then later it dropped off, and then later in this new enlightenment, uh, people like Romeo and Norman and so on, Benny Andrews, mm -hmm. became well, well known. Mm -hmm. Now, how does the foundation try to translate that message to the younger people, to the younger artists? The message of, um, of sort of incubating yeah. artists and mm -hmm. then um, waiting for your time. <laughs> well, now, um, may you, now is your time. That now right. is your time. Well, um, we do a number of things. Uh, we try to reach um, potential artists um, as young people. So mm -hmm. we have um, a scholarship program with the Harlem School of the Arts, mm -hmm. um, trying to target specifically um, kids who are putting together portfolios to go into high school. Um, in the arts. Um, and then we also try to reach them in the college level um, with, um, with scholarships and programs like the Sinke panel programs. Um, but I think that it's um, important to say about Romare is that he had um, a rich, rich life that um, he was learning from and gathering um, for a very long time and, um, and creating work perhaps in his head in a way that um, when it was his time, it was just a very natural extension of all the things that he'd been thinking about and doing. You know, taking in um, life in rural, you know, North Carolina. And um, he goes back to that um, place in his mind um, for many, many years. I mean, he went back as a child, where his grandparents lived there, um, but then when he's in New York in the 70s, um, surrounded by, you know, um, Canal Street even, and Harlem, he starts doing work that's based on that locale in um, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, so that's important to know how artists gather their information and how they incubate um, many of these life um, lessons into their art. Um, and I think the foundation is aware that these things happen when you're younger. We've created a curriculum based on not just his art, but also his life. Um, and I think that is something that 
Um, everyone can tap into, um, it's a K through 12, but everyone taps into it. Teachers, it's a great resource um, for museums and schools. And, um, and so then also we create a symposium every couple of years. We, we call it our National Symposium Series, where we're encouraging scholars to continue um, delving into Bearden and creating new scholarship. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, you're just supporting one single artist, um, but it's not true. Um, even with our symposiums, we hit on a lot of information about um, artists that were his contemporaries. And of course, we're always um, creating spaces for new artists to connect with Bearden and the legacy. Now, if someone is in a school or an organization, could they contact you about getting some videos or some uh, printed material about Romare Bearden, about black artists? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, particularly about Bearden. Um, but one of the things I like to, um, to say about the foundation is we're a very small operation and we do focus on Bearden's work, but um, I think if we can survive as an organization, right now we're, we're the longest running um, institution of its kind um, that supports an artist, an African American artist. Um, we just have been around for a while and we are doing, um, we are putting some things in place that I think um, can become a model for what's needed for other artists. All African American artists, all artists need foundations. Um, and I see the work that we do where we house the archives, we house his library, we provide resource materials as something that's needed for every single artist. And as we grow, we often try to, to take on more of that work, but we are a small institution. Where are the archives located? It's in our building, um, in our office, um, 2090 Adam Clayton Powell, and that's the old Teresa Hotel building. We're on the second floor. We have our offices. And researchers and could go there and look through your archives yes. and find out information about yes. Romare Bearden. Yes, yes. Now, what about the black arts movement in mm -hmm. the 60s and 70s? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much do you stress that in your work? Um, you know, where it pertains to Romare, like for instance, we put together um, an exhibition at the Nathan Cummings. Um, a while ago, and um, we focused on Bearden's activism, an artist as an activist. Um, we had a panel discussion with Amiri Baraka, and we talked a lot about what um, artists can do as activists. Um, you know, they have their work as their tools, and um, I think Cinque and Spiral, um, the organization that Bearden was, it's an artist collective that Bearden was co um, connected to. I think that's the way that artists can um, can interact with people. It's a form, art is a form of communication. And so, um, in the '60s, the early '60s, when Bearden and his fellow artists in Spiral, you know, you're talking about Emma Amos, um, Richard Mayhew, um, Norman Lewis, and others, when they were trying to respond to the civil rights movement. Um, they decided to, to have this organization that would mount shows together. And one show that came out of that was a black and white show. Mm -hmm. and, and this is key for Bearden's career as well because it became a moment where um, he started doing collage in a way that people recognize his work today um, still. Um, he created the projection series from that work. And there's a well-known story, I'm sure many of you um, know it, and I'm sure you know it, where um, he comes to one of the spiral meetings and he wants to do this collective artwork. So he brings bags of scraps and um, he thinks that he's going to engage the other artist in doing these collage works because collage was a practice um, that um, artists were engaged in then. And <clears throat> Of course, none of the other artists are interested. They're interested in doing their own thing. <laughs> and so Bearden does pursue um, doing these collage, collages for the show. And um, they, they just started out as eight and a half by 11 size collage mm -hmm. um, clippings from Look, Life, all of those ebony magazines. And, um, and then those works, those tiny collage are then seen in his studio and his dealer at the time decides this would make a great show, but they're not big enough. Mm -hmm. And so he, he enlarges them, he projects them into the space. 
uh, and they become the work that people become most interested and know Bearden from the most. It's interesting how the temporality of the civil rights movement and the emergence of these new art forms mm -hmm. uh, caught everybody's attention. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing I found is that much of this was bought by white art patrons, mm -hmm. because many of the African-American art patrons either didn't have the resources or didn't have the appreciation of this new art form. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you think he got around that? How did he get around that? Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I think um, at the time that Romeo was working, I, it was not, um, there weren't that many galleries mm -hmm. that were showing African American artists. He was one person who was able to break some of those barriers as long um, as he fit into those um, kinds of um, new things that were happening, like collage, um, like, I mean, he was also, you know, painting, abstract paintings mm -hmm. um, in the late 50s, early 60s, um, and they were very, you know, much like the abstract expressionist of the time, and that's how he fit in, that's how he sort of snuck in, I guess you could say. Um, and these new forms, I think, you know, collage was something that was used by artists in the 50s mm -hmm. and 60s, but he takes it to a whole nother level, um, you know, and completely breaks up the space. Um, and he's, you know, because he's a student of art history and he just loves the old masters and 13th century painters, he's, he's playing with space and form in a way that's new to people, new to even the medium of collage. Um, he was very much a cubist and interested in what Matisse and Picasso were doing. He, you know, he yeah. studied these guys. And so um, I think he was able to incorporate the work and inco incorporate the ideas into his art in a way that makes him unique for that medium. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in, in terms of, um, the, this moment, this you know, moment in politics, moment in social history, um, converging with that medium, Bearden uses it to bring in many different um, cultural references mm -hmm. um, that appeal to people on many levels, and he creates an almost universal form that everyone can relate to. Um, so you have this, um, you know, collage image of a person that has part of an African mask, mm -hmm. part of something from art history, um, part of, you know, something you'd see in Life magazine, um, and, and, and then the street, the form. So it, it's many different levels. And, and the other thing about that moment is about the way that we started seeing images um, on TV, mm -hmm. um, black and white images in the newspaper. And so you have these, um, these ways of looking that become um, very immediate with collage and um, very journalistic in a way, the way that he's using the black and white um, for, for the projection series. That pe and then when you blow it up, you know, you project it into the space, it's undeniable. It's in your face, you have to look at it, and it's very immediate. Um, and so he's showing images of African Americans that a lot of people just didn't even see or didn't think about. Well, when do you think he really began to be recognized? Because many artists do their art for themselves and their local uh, artistic community. But at some particular point in time, the name Romain Bearden got associated with abstractionist, creative, visionary African American. When do you think that happened? Did that happen during the Civil Rights Movement? Did that happen because of some recognition and some uh, award? Or did it happen because a gallery picked it up? When do you think that happened? Well, um, I think everybody would have a different answer for that. What's your <laughs> but, answer? Um, <laughs> I'm going to say that my answer um, was around the time when he um, starts to, when he quits his job, mm -hmm. um, quits being a, a social worker, and he devotes all of his time to making art, and um, he gets a show at the... Um, at MoMA, I mean the Museum of Modern Art, um, he's showing with Martin, um, not Martin Puree, I'm sorry, he's showing with um, the other sculptor, um, I can't think of his name, but they, they are create, they, they're getting in museums and having museum shows 
where artists weren't even getting, some artists weren't getting gallery shows. Mm -hmm. um, so this is historic, and, um, and I think finally he gets some recognition. You know, the, art, the art world is a very tight elitist still to this day. Things move very slowly um, into the art world, um, ideas and concepts and recognition. Uh, and usually you have one, <laughs> you know, African American who's who's doing well in the in the art world at at any given time. Now doing well consists of being recognized and having your work bought That's right. by art patrons, right. museums. Right, right. But it don't it doesn't always mean that your art is fetching the same prices as some of your contemporaries, um, which is one of the things we. Um, struggle with at the foundation is because when we were started, um, Nanette, Romeo's wife, um, was the one who actually set up the foundation from the will, and there wasn't a lot of money for this. Um, and you know, people look at us now and they think we're a foundation with lots of money we can give away. Um, but m my argument is, well, we never started with a lot of money mm -hmm. um, because his work was not fetching the kind of prices that his contemporaries were at the same time. I mean, you, you know, look at a Andy Warhol, mm -hmm. um, whose foundation, um, you know, is, you know, it's sizable and they can do lots of things and they do good work. Um, but Bearden's, Bearden's work was never at that level. And even to this day, we struggle with what goes on in the auctions with Bearden's prices. Um, so, you know, that's just, you know, that, that is what it is, but, but it, it, it says something about foundations and how they can support artists and support the legacies of these artists if they don't have money. In a sense, the, the culture of a people is seen through its art, mm -hmm. and African Americans have great literature, great poetry, mm -hmm. great music, great dance, uh, and great visual art. To what extent was Romer able to integrate some of those other forms of art into his work? Well, um, he, he had a very big head and a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. um, he has a famous quote where he says an artist needs to be like a whale, um, going through life, taking in everything, um, sort of digesting it, picking out what you want and using it. Um, and also he involved himself in the arts because he was an interest. He had a great interest in um, jazz music he in did. particular. Um, jazz is a very special thing for him and his work because he actually takes the structure of improvisational music and talks about how he uses that mm -hmm. to create the structure in his work, which is profound to me um, as a painter because you are always looking for these different layers in art, and that is one layer that not everybody will get. Maybe a musician will come at it and look at it and see that, or maybe um, a child will come and see the figures and won't get to that level, or maybe an art history student will look at it, or an artist, and see different things that he's doing, but you don't all, there's many different layers, and not everybody gets the same layers. But um, I do think, too, because of his spirit, um, he was, you know, a humanist. I mean, and he just mm -hmm. loved people. He, he loved um, ideas. Um, he studied mathematics. Um, he was going to, his, his parents, I think, thought when he went to college that he might be a doctor. Um, and he played baseball. And so he had a lot of interest. And, um, and so he gets this into the art on a lot of different levels. Um, but I think that he uh, took on many things that would then, uh, I mean, uh, particularly about African American history and art, he felt like he could communicate those things um, in a unique way. In a sense, he was a civil rights pioneer mm -hmm. long before others in yes. the art world was, were, were pioneers. Right. Now, recently, the 100th anniversary of his birth, the U.S. Postal Service created a stamp in honor of Romare Bearden. Tell us about that. They actually created four stamps. Okay. Um, That's good. Um, <laughs> four images, Falling Star, um, a piece from his, um, his Odyssey series, which is the sea, Poseidon the Sea God, and Conjunction and Conjure Woman. If anyone is familiar with his work, Prevalence of Ritual, Conjure Woman is just a beautiful piece. And, um, 
and they created four stamps that are considered forever stamps. So you can go out and buy up hundreds of them and they'll still be usable <laughs> in the years to come. But this is a unbelievable honor, I mean, for an artist. Um, there's well, just, how did that happen? There's not that many stamps dedicated to art, to yeah, visual well, how, how did you make that happen? I, I would love to say that the foundation made it happen. <laughs> I think in some indirect way, we are always talking about Beard and always putting the legacy out there, keeping things active, keeping scholars interested in his work. But I can't say we had anything to do with it um, directly. Uh, they called us and they said they wanted to do this stamp. I tried to press upon them certain other images only because I wanted them to do a jazz stamp too, mm -hmm. but they had their, their four set stamps. They came to us for licensing. We had, we had very little to do with it, but then we, we are responsible for making sure that the legacy continues, and so they did consult us. And, um, and so we were just happy that this was being done. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think that there is, um, there's a nominating committee and Henry Louis Gates might have had something to do with that. He's one of the advisors on our, one of our advisory board members. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know how these things are done. It's probably some secret committee <laughs> that gets it done. Sure. But it certainly is his time. I know you have to be dead for a certain amount of years yeah. to get on a U.S. postage stamp. Um, so he's definitely paid his, his dues. <laughs> Yeah. And, and one can get it by going to their local postal office? Yes, yes. And um, hopefully they have them in stock. Um, we had a um, celebration for the unveiling of the stamps, and they were going like hotcakes. Um, so let's hope that they can keep them in stock for at least two years. But if you buy them up, um, you can get them at the post offices. You can order them online. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are forever stamped, so you can use them over and over again later. Now, at the uh, dedication, mm -hmm. was a, a group of black artists who were there, mm -hmm. or were they civil rights leaders? Uh, how did that work out? Well, um, the U.S. Postage Service, U.S. Postal Service, um, was responsible for creating um, this event, this unveiling, and they brought it to New York. They, I think, choose places that are relevant to the artist and um, so they chose, they, they did consult with us and asked us what would be some good places to have it and um, I gave them a whole list of you know Studio Museum of Harlem, the Schomburg, NYU mm -hmm. which Bearden attended, right. Columbia which is near our, our office spaces and he you know has a lot of connections there. Um, and they chose the Schomburg, um, a very historical place, a place that ha happened to have a show of Bearden's work um, at that time uh, as part of the centennial. And, um, and of course, they have a brand new director, um, um, but Howard Dotson was always a supporter of the foundation and of Bearden's work. Um, but the new director, um, Khalil Muhammad, um, as welcomed them and um, we had a wonderful beautiful ceremony um, and so the um, deputy postmaster general was there um, and he is an african-american um, beautiful um, person who um, was there representing the post office which was wonderful um, one of our board members um, participated um, E.T. Williams and then Thelma Golden of the um, studio the museum, museum. Uh, was the mistress of ceremonies. So that was very exciting for now, us. Now, clearly one of your missions is to carry the message of Bearden to the younger generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some of the things you're actually doing to reach out to the younger generations, you know, junior high school, elementary right. school kids? Right. Well, the Harlem School of the Arts Scholarship is oh. one. Mm -hmm. um, we also created a, the curriculum that I mentioned earlier that we... Um, we have a program where we teach teachers to use the curriculum. Uh -huh. um, so we have educator workshops. Um, we put a teaching artist in schools. We have um, a program in a Harlem school now um, called Global Tech. And so our teacher that's been trained in the curriculum um, goes in and works on many different levels. Sometimes it just depends on what the school needs. So sometimes she's working with um, teachers on the regular curriculum inserting art 
in that program. Um, and then it's also a standalone art program for a school that has no art anymore. Um, and so um, they, they did wonderful things. They made films. They um, did murals at the school to beautify the school. Um, and this was helpful to the school because then they were able to get a matching grant that helped to create these murals and support our teacher. Um, but basically, we're taking Bearden and the curriculum into the schools and saying that this is a wholesome way of teaching art. Um, we have 10 chapters. We go into planes of color. We go into line and drawing. We go into his own history. Um, there's a book that the foundation um, published posthumously. Uh, we, we had the manuscript in the archives, which is a good reason for us to have archives, <laughs> and then we had the art. We have a small collection of Bearden's work, and the art, the, the um, actual illustrations were there because this was a book that Bearden tried to shop around in the 70s mm -hmm. called Little Dan. And so we, it wasn't successful shopping it around them, but we put it together and we were able to interest Simon and & Schuster, the children's division, in putting a little damn book together. So we produced that. And that's a wonderful story of bravery and African-American history. It's, it's called Little Dan, A Civil War Story. Um, so here you have a little boy who, you know, just uses the resources that he has, he knows how to play a drum, to help the soldiers, you know, by making sounds that sound like shotguns or whatever, so that the soldiers know, have a warning to get out of the way. So Deirdre Harris Kelly, mm -hmm. the co-director of the Romare Bearden Foundation, is beating the drum <laughs> of black hearts. Thanks for being with I us like on today's African American Thank Legends. You. Thank you. <laughs>